In this video, we are going to talk about USB and especially because there are so many USBs from 2, 0, 3, 4, all the kind of connectors, all the kind of different power delivery. And we would like to clear this in this video. So I really hope you will find it useful. And uh, I'm going to ask Jit to explain all this. Uh, so where should we start, Jit? Like with something like this slide? Yes, Robert, thanks. Um, that's a great question. Uh, even sometimes I'm confused by all the different terms and terminologies. But I think the first thing we want to think about is to split it into two areas. So one is what we call signaling speeds and one is what we call connectors. So when you hear words like USB 1, USB 2, USB 3, USB 4, USB 4 version 2, that's what we call the signaling speeds. Okay. And if you hear words like, uh, you know, A connect A or USB A or USB B and USB C, that's called a connector. So I think the first thing to know is those are two uh, totally separate topics. Which okay. Is, there's and a second like... speed and there's a connector. They are completely separate uh, uh, specifications on these completely separate topics. Okay, I have a question. So uh, I see there are different kind of connectors for different kind of speed, like USB 3.0. I see it can be on type A, type B, um, micro B, type C. So uh, what kind of connectors are these? I think it's on the uh, next slide. Let's have a look on the connectors. Yeah, so to answer the first comment, you're correct. So different technologies were run on different connectors. Mm -hmm. So for example, as you rightly noticed, USB 3 will run on the A, B, micro B, C mm -hmm. connectors. But if you look to the right side, way to the right, you will notice that USB 4 must run on only the type C connector. Mm -hmm. So there are requirements for connectors depending on the signaling speed. Now to answer your next question, um, yes, there are, now this is the connector type. So again, it has nothing to do with the uh, signaling speeds, but um, you've heard of the A connectors. So you have the, uh, the A, uh, standard A, then you have the, uh, like a mini connector. Uh, this is actually uh, mini Bs. Uh, micro Bs, uh, standard Bs. So actually this slide is a little confusing, but there's an A connector and then there is a bunch of different B connectors, like a standard B, a mini B, and a micro B. And then of course on the right side, in many ways, things got much clearer. There's only one type C connector. There's no, um, there's just one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have another question. I think there are even like uh, micro A, micro B, micro AB. So, or I may be wrong, but I think that's why uh, that's what specifies what you can plug into what, or they're a little bit different or? That's correct. So there are even other variations on that, but um, prior to US, uh, the PD spec, there was a notion of a host and device. So generally, a type A was found on a host product. It's like PC, so, for example. Exactly, on a PC. Let's just use PC. So you see on the, when I say older, I mean, even today's PC, you see a type A connector, which is the one on the top left. And then on devices, uh, on the older printers, and I still have one of those, you see a standard B, which is a rectangle thing on the bottom left. And then, um, in fact, some of key site solutions still use a mini B connector. And I still have chargers. In fact, uh, the charger for my uh, headset here is a micro B. So prior to type C, the connector type was uh, required on certain P 
PCs or the connected type was required on a device. So for example, you could not put a type A connector on a device. So there were other uh, restrictions like that because prior to PDE, the host or the type A a PC would always provide charging Mm -hmm. to the device. Mm -hmm. So this was a a way to protect the the PC and the device. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, we should not be able to connect two power supplies together. That's the main goal of A and B. Robert, you nailed it. That's exactly correct. With the prior to PD, you you, you did not want to accidentally somehow connect two PCs power supplies together. That, okay, that's absolutely the the, the reason. Because the prior to PD, there's no way uh, uh, to, to to for for a device, shall we say, to charge a, a a PC, which is not true today. Things changed completely with Type C connector and the type P, the, the PD spec. Okay, so let's have a look on this type C because I think this is, uh, if someone is really designing something uh, today and they are going to add USB, then I've seen almost everyone is now using type C connectors, correct? Using something older, that's maybe not what we would like to do on new boards or what is what is your thought about this? Shall we use USB-C? Um, you know, uh, I always love to use my mom as example. <laughs> so she, uh, she, 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 she lives in Malaysia still. She's uh, uh, 85 years old and I'm her full-time IT support. So, and she comes from a different world where um, I bought her a USB 2 type A mouse many years ago. And as long as that mouse will work with duct tape, She wants to make sure that she can use her mouse. Because of that, this new computer I have in front of me still has a standard A, type A receptacle so that my mom can plug in her uh, standard A USB 2 mouse. But Robert, to answer your question, the answer is yes. If our customers are uh, looking at a future implementation, a new product uh, that they're looking at, there is no question they must start to investigate uh, implementing only with type C because it is a future. It brings a lot of huge benefits. Uh, it's complicated uh, because um, it's got so many capabilities, but they should go forward. Now, what happens if you, my mom still wants to use her, her type A? Mouse. Well, there are adapters. Mm-hmm. So there are always C to A receptacles, etc., that still allow my mom to use her, her USB mm-hmm. 2 mouse. And it's because, short answer, yes, it's because Type C also contains USB 2 signals. But we, I think we will have a look on signals a little bit later. Uh, first, indeed, uh, indeed. Yeah. So first, indeed. I would like to uh, go maybe one slide back. And I would like to understand a little bit uh, more differences between like, I don't know, USB 3.0 and USB 3.2. Because uh, like two years ago, I was so confused, like which one I should use with what connectors and <laughs> what to buy. So what are the differences? They will be always compatible, just the speed is different? Or what does it mean? Yeah, I have actually another slide. Okay. Uh, on that, if you like, we could switch to yeah, okay. that slide, or we could use this one. Um, that slide, and I want to, uh, I think was back here. So to answer your question, Robert, first, ignore this top half, because it's, it's also got its own set of complexities. Okay, so ignore this part that says users, USB 4 version 2, and let's focus on this section that says USB 3 and part of why there is so much confusion. So and when USB IF came out with a USB 3.0 specification, which is this here, USB 3.0 specification, it only ran at a fire rate of five gig. Mm-hmm. Later on, the USB IF came up with a next generation called 10 gig. 
the spec document became USB 3.1. Somewhere along the line, USB IF decided to unify both of these spec documents into something called USB 3.2, Gen 1, Gen 2, 5 gig and 10 gig. So the spec is deprecated. Deprecated means it's gone. So today, if our customers implement USB 3, they must not look at a USB 3.0 spec. They must not look at an old USB 3.1 spec. There's only one spec. They must use the USB 3.2 spec, which describes the Gen 1 5 gig rate and the Gen 2 10 gig rate. Now I'm going to add something else. Because of all this confusion, that's a lot of, of words in the, on, out there. The USB IF has now added a logo. So the logo talks about five gig rate and 10 gig rate, okay? So for customers, the bigger the number, the better or the faster the USB connector. So can you recognize your USB generation by, by on this logo, like one, it if it's 10 gig, it means it is three. Oh, okay. There, there will be only 3.2 now. Yeah. So now, so let's split. So again, I keep using my mom example. So my mom only cares about this part. We, our customers in the world care about this part. Now, I think you ask questions. Can you relate this back to that? This is where things get even more confusing because what I did not show here, Robert, is something called by two mode. So a USB 3.2 Gen 1 5 will run at 5 gig with this logo. But there is an optional, there's an optional mode whereby a USB 3.2 Gen 1 5 gigs product can run in by two mode where they use both lanes of a type C connector. It will happens only in type C. In that case, the file rate is 10 gig. So they could actually sell a five gig by two computer as 10 gig. Now, again, my mom doesn't know behind the scenes, but as engineers, as implementers, um, we all need to be aware that USB 3.2 has a by one mode where they run say gen one at five gig on one lane or a by two mode where they run gen one five gig or gen two 10 gig in by two mode. So technically, technically, a Gen 2 10 gig by two could be advertised as a 20 gig mm -hmm. PC. So once again, I want to focus only on this area because once you get up here, it's got the same level of decoding. But again, for a consumer's perspective, we have to, there's a line right here. My mom lives on this side. It's a branding, it's a logo. On the left side, you will not, no longer see this on products. The USB IF does not allow this wording anymore mm -hmm. on branded product. This is required for folks like us who have to test and implement these speeds. So very often I see that this highest speed is almost never achieved and sometimes I know in many cases it's because device doesn't need this speed, but you may have like very, you may have hard disk, external hard disk or something, which really need this kind of speed. But on the other side, sometimes there are weak processors and these processors, so what? They, oh, say processors like, got yeah, it. Okay. They, they say like they have USB 3 on the board, but the processor is so slow, it's not able to handle this kind of speed. Um, I think there's some evidence of that. Like you mentioned, the, the CPU or processor has impact on it, but I think this has to do with the overhead. So a USB port cannot run at different speed. So as far as the link speed goes, let's say this is a USB 3 uh, 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 PC connected to USB 3 product. So first of all, to your point, they must both link up their highest speed. Mm -hmm. So the 10 gig PC will run with a 10 gig okay. drive. But if the drive is 5 gig, then clearly the PC has to be able to downshift or fall back to 5 gig. So that link will always run at 5 gig. But to your point, if the CPU is weak or it's processing something else, 
then it's not putting all its time into that communication, if you will. So it has to do with the overhead in the communication, mm -hmm. but never in the link, because that link cannot, mm -hmm. a five gig USB link cannot say run at you know, two and a half. Now it can link down to USB two, but it cannot, it cannot transfer at a different rate. It might go to sleep or take a break, but mm -hmm. when it's talking, the link is up, it will always run only at the USB three or whatever rate it is linked up to. Right, so the rate doesn't change, but perhaps the the, the communication between the PC and the, the drive got stalled because the mm -hmm. CPU is is shall we say distracted by other mm -hmm. tasks like moving my mom's USB two mounts, perhaps. Okay, I understand. So the link will be ten gig, but it doesn't mean also the transfer is ten gig. Uh, no, the the transfer is. But I mean it the may transfer be between. Processor and the device is 10 gig. Between USB controller and the USB device, there can be 10 gig, but not between processor and. Yes, you're correct. So let's look at the, the use case you had alluded to. So let's say the uh, the uh, let's walk through this end. The CPU is trying to read from a drive, so it tells the drive, "Let's I want to read out a huge, you know, gigabit, you know, gigabyte file." So it starts transferring at a 10 gig rate. And it starts moving stuff right from the USB controller into its memory. Well, if the memory is slower or it's not able to handle it, then there's going to be a pause in the transfer, right? Some kind of buffering is going mm -hmm. on. So now the, the, the transfer almost has to stop while the CPU and the system mm -hmm. catches up with the, uh, shall we say, uh, reading or writing in the, the, the memory while the CPU is doing other things. Mm -hmm. So you are absolutely correct. The link and the controller to the device, when it's running, will, can only run at 10 gig, but behind the scenes, uh, the CPU may choke at the, the amount of data, and mm -hmm. you might have to put it in a buffer or, and stop the, the transfer. I don't understand what happens from a PC perspective, but certainly that can happen if there is a delay, mm -hmm. say between moving data at you know 80 gig, for example, from the USB controller to the memory or mm -hmm. wherever else they're moving it around. Okay, you answered my question. So uh, let's compare this to the USB 2. I think you have another slide uh, which also show the speed for the USB 2. Yes, I think um, I think this, the original slide 80 something had at speed 2. Yes, it does. Okay, yeah, so, 1.5 is the very first it, one. Yes, back in way back, we need to fix that slide because it's got this, uh, can I even make it bigger? Ooh, all right. Yes, so way, way back in 1996, before I was born, there was USB 1.1 that ran at an amazing 1.5 megabits per second. And it went, uh, 480 times faster, approximately. In USB 2, it went to 480 megabits per second. So that's uh, generally most products are. Uh, uh, the USB 3.1 spec is also deprecated. So customers today must also implement only to the USB 2.0 spec. Just like I mentioned there earlier, uh, USB 3.0, 3.1 are deprecated or removed. Customers must implement only to the USB 3.2 spec. So um, all, all, all products uh, must implement to USB 2.0 spec at 480 megabits, but the 1.1 rate, if you will, is also um, available within uh, USB 2.0 mm -hmm. spec. Uh, so I had a question how this speed was increased. So what what are the changes between different versions? So what change like signal levels or how could we go from 1.5 megabit to 480 megabit and then from 480 to 5 gig? We have more lines, we have more higher speed. Yeah, that's or... a great, great question. So there are two ways. One is more lines by by two. 
but really a lot have to do with the incredible advances in silicon magic. And the reason I use the word silicon magic is to a large extent, the USB ecosystem is a low cost ecosystem. Let me explain what I mean by that. Every few years you get a brand new PC, but you'll notice that you can buy a PC for, you know, between 500 to $1,000, no matter how new or how great it is. So customers like my mom don't want to pay more than about $1,000 for a PC every few years. Same for me. It's mm -hmm. a very low cost system. And the cables, customers don't want to spend $100 for optical cable. My mom will not want to buy a $100 optical cable. So the cables are very low cost, very lossy. The PCBs also built an old technology that's also very low cost. So you have the, from a, so if you look at, look at a link, you have a, you know, a PC a silicon to a device silicon. And between that, you have the PCB, the connectors, the cables. If you, if you keep the PCB low cost, the connector low cost, and my mom's cable low cost, what is left? Silicon magic. And so the silicon has to be able to run much faster. And that's where the gains are. And uh, I think I've had a slice on that. The, the general concept in the silicon magic is, you have heard the word uh, equalization. So in silicon magic, you have transmitter equalization, which was like uh, uh, FFE, you've got receiver uh, equalization with words like DFE, clock recovery, CTLE, that silicon magic, it's what's at a high level going from 1.5 megabits, not that long ago to 80 gigabits today. So what does it mean equalization? I know <clears throat> Actually, I was making video a couple of days ago where we talk about this. So I I just learned it a couple of days ago, but I think it's good to talk uh, about this uh, in case uh, someone who is watching never heard about this. So what, what is it doing? Um, I I don't have that slide. Uh, I may have some some slides. Let me uh, let me find a slide on that equalization. So. I do have a slide. So let me let me uh, show you the what is meant by equalization here. I do have the slide. Maybe you can search for it. Oh, in the slides you can find there stuff is search like that. On the top you have search there. Maybe let me just... see how that works. It can actually see these words in these pictures too, yes, like I that. Can see it, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Okay. In pictures, no, I don't think it can see text in okay. pictures. So um, so first, let me uh, give an overview of the um, of the uh, uh, equalization. So, equalization is a technique for silicon to compensate for a lossy channel. That's a very uh, uh, simple, high-level view of equalization: a way for silicon to compensate for a lossy channel. So, and there are both sides of silicon: the transmitter equalization and receiver equalization. Okay, so in this slide, we have USB 3.2 Gen 1 at 5 gig, and you will see it's minus 3 dB. That means it's got a TXEQ, the emphasis of minus 3 dB. But when we went to Gen 2, we had to add more equalization. So now we added something called pre-shoot of 2.2 dB, and the emphasis of minus 3.1 dB. This essentially is a way of, shall we say, pre-distorting the transmitter signal before it enters the channel so that when it comes out, it actually looks better. I know it's kind of, it's kind of strange, but that's how TX equalization works, to, to pre-distort the signal so it actually looks better on the other side. So that's this TX equalization. On the receiver equalization, you see now they have more sophisticated. You have something called CTLE or continuous time linear equalization. That's for Gen 1, but notice for Gen 2, because it's faster, not only do they have the CTLE, you also have a DFE, decision feedback equalization. 
it's also a way for the receiver to change its threshold level to be able to recover the signal. Bottom line is these have gotten more complex. So let me jump all the way to USB 4 version 2 today. All the way. Uh, so maybe, maybe. So I would like to just clarify. So basically, this is some kind of technique which can change parameters or property parameters of the transceiver and receiver to adjust to specific uh, specific channel properties. So basically you tweak the transmitter and receiver to get the best signal as you can for this specific channel. Robert, you bring up a really good point. So when a link partner gets together, you need to link up. The first thing they do as part of Phi Electrical is to optimize the channel. So as part of this uh, uh, link up, the transmitter receiver communicate to each other and decide what is the optimal transmitter equalization and optimal receiver equalization for that link. Mm -hmm. You are absolutely correct. That's part of the, the, the link up process. And how they communicate? Optimize. Do they communicate through the USB 3 signals or through USB 2 or how does it work? It's a great question. So for USB 3, the, the communication is done over the high speed lanes of a type C connector. But when they went to USB 4, that switched. So that's done over the sideband uh, channels mm -hmm. in the type C connector. So the answer is correct for USB 3, high speed, but for USB 4, they do it on the low speed sideband channel uh, communication link. So I guess all these things m make it more complicated to actually validate your USB uh, interface on the boards and on the devices because you really need to have like something special to be able to do all these things, equalizations and communicate and measure You and... are correct. So my mom has a great USB experience in the future, uh, talking to getting USB-C. It can do all these wonderful things, it runs fast. So that's the, uh, the customer experience. But if you bring up a good point from a uh, implementation behind the scenes perspective, from a testing perspective, there's so much stuff to do now because you are correct. We have to physically test every single one of these TX EQs and also the receive equalization and the cable. So yes, everything, all these complexities absolutely has to be tested. You are correct. A tricky question now. So what if someone can't buy expensive uh, devices to do this kind of measurements? Is there some kind of can they buy, I don't know, highest speed USB 3 hard drive or something and, and use it for testing USB channel? Uh, you bring up a good point. So what you're describing is what we call interop of functionally test. So let's say you, you we are in the business of doing a PC and we have this brand new you know, USB 3 or 4 port. We certainly can test it out. We can certainly hook it up to a, a USB 3 device and it reads it right, we could say, perfect, let's ship it. Um, one of the key uh, different, uh, the reason why Kisa even exists and we test, is really about the customer experience. Let me, let me describe that. In an ideal condition, this PC that you and I, this company we started, will work with this USB 3 device. But, if we built and our business is very successful and we build a hundred or a thousand, can we always guarantee that link will work? The reason is because there's a tolerance, okay? How can we determine the tolerance of our PC? Or what if customers buy a different drive? Mm -hmm. different there's probably cable. a thousand drives there, different cable. Because of the variation, uh, TNM, test management has to do with looking at the measurements and the statistics of measurements. And in particular, we can do margins. Now we can simulate this, Robert. What we can do is let's say we decide not to uh, invest in test equipment. We can take this PC and we can run it under temperature. We can buy a big oven and we can run this PC up and down because that will, that will allow us to look at margins. Mm -hmm. So we, we can buy maybe 
instead of a thousand, maybe 500 devices, we can hook them, right? Because we need to control those devices. And we can run in a chamber, running hot and cold, maybe, you know, and that will also do margin. Now, let's, we, let's say we do that and it, something fails. Now, Robert, what do we do? Mm -hmm. How do we figure out what failed? Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, we can only do so much without testing. Yes, we can do functional tests, we can run the temperature, but once we know the failure, we, we need to understand the root cause. So ultimately, we may be forced mm -hmm. to still connect some test equipment to see out which parameter in all these parameters um, failed. Mm -hmm. By the way, so. uh, in the company <clears throat> where I used to work, we actually uh, rented the scope and uh, this kind of uh, all the fixtures and everything to uh, validate the Ethernet and USB. So it's not really necessary to buy the most expensive equipment. Uh, there are options also to rent it. Yeah, I'm not completely familiar with the process, etc. But I, I know that Keysight works with what we call rental partners mm -hmm. to be able to rent Keysight equipment, mm -hmm. say for like, uh, I think you can rent for a one month or six months for a project and then uh, and then return it, right? A rental. Mm -hmm. Or I think, again, the rental companies have information. You can rent to buy also. So you rent for one or two months. And if the project is runs longer or you find that you need it, then I think I think there are some certain ways you can get credit mm -hmm. also from the uh, from the rental. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go back to the USB-C connector and, and talk about the USB-C pinout because that's what is now like super popular. Every Everyone is using this. So we would like to understand a little bit better as hardware design engineer, how we need to connect this USB-C. It's a great question. So as uh, engineers, we must understand the gory details. So even though the Type-C connector is tiny, it's a very small connector, much smaller than all the other var variants. It has way more pins. It has 24 pins. And let me start by uh, sharing what was found in previous versions. What you see here with this D plus and minus is actually USB 2. So USB 2 only had two signal pins, D plus, D minus, of course, uh, power, V bus and ground. So it, it really had four pins, signaling with D plus minus, and power, V bus, and, and ground, right? So that's uh, four pins. You will notice that just from my mom's mouse, the Type-C connector has a dedicated D plus and minus. It has a dedicated USB 2 pin, which is what I mentioned earlier, which is Type-C connectors, whether it's USB 3, 4, whatever, must implement USB 2, and they occur over the dedicated D plus and minus pins. Now, one question folks will have is, well, hold on, what's different between the receptacle and the cable a plug for D plus and minus. Why are there more D plus and minus? This has to do with the fact that the type C cable is reversible. Remember we said there's only one signal, D plus and minus, but the cable could be flipped or twisted. So on the cable side, which is the bottom picture, there's only one USB 2 pin pair but the host or receptacle side of device must have two because the cable could connect to this pair In this way or, this or way. that pair exactly correct robert so that's why you see two usb pairs here and only one here if essentially the only one pair will go through because there's no by two mode for usb uh, two it's only by one so you either works this pair or that pair mm -hmm. okay so that's the usb2 so i could make i'm trying to make a connection between the original uh, usb2 you running over say a standard a or b connector and the type c and of course v bus 
in red. So on USB 2, you had the you know, single V bus in ground, but you notice over here, there are actually four USB, uh, uh, sorry, it's four V bus pins and four ground pins because there's a lot more voltage and current mm -hmm. that has to go through compared to previous generations. Let's go to the next uh, level here. With, with USB 3, they added two more pins. So in USB 3 technologies, the, the pin got uh, uh, more. So for example, on a, um, a B connector, you notice there's a B rectangle and there's a little hump, there's a version with, a, with extra little hump on it or a micro B, there's the, like two little B connectors. That's when they added TX and RX pins. So when USB IF went to USB 3, they added one TX pair and one RX mm -hmm. pair. Okay. That's what you see over here. So this type C connector allows the, the usage of USB 3.2 running over the TX and RX pair. For example, let's say the, uh, this pair over here. Mm -hmm. Okay. TX1 and RX1. Mm -hmm. And when the cable is flipped, then it uses this other pair. Mm -hmm. So it uses this pair or, or this pair. Mm -hmm. That's 3.0. That's yeah, 3.2. 3.2, okay. 3.2. <laughs> now, they added by two mode. Ah, okay. So that's the mm -hmm. by two mode when you use all in four. In USB three point two, you you nailed it, Robert. You 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 absolutely nailed it. In three point two mode, they use both the TX RX one pair and the TX RX two pair mm -hmm. in by two mode for USB three, and for USB four, it's it's always by spec in by two mode. So they always use both TX and RX pairs always mm -hmm. okay so we have talked about the ground tx v bus let's talk about cc1 and cc2 those are used exclusively for pd it's used for pd communication what, what that, pd that, mean uh power delivery for the usb power delivery uh, specification and again cc1 and cc2 and again notice there's only one cc pin on the cable in the very early days of PD, um, there were non-compliant cables. That, for example, well, there are other issues, but one other issue they had was they added two CC pins or two CC lines in the cable. That is not correct. Okay, so only one CC pin, depending on how it's flipped, it either connects to CC two or CC one to set up the CC, the one CC connection. Okay, so based on the, if if cable is plugged this way or this way. The CC can tell you actually which way the con the cable is plugged in. That's exactly right, and it talks the, the PD and it also determines which pair works right, which which uh, TX RX pair. Mm -hmm. But there's no by two PD mode or CC mode, mm -hmm. so it only communicates on one CC line on the cable. So that's what the CC one and CT two line is for. Okay. And I think, I think there is also some kind of circuit, external circuit, which is connected to these pins. But we can then absolutely. talk about this a little bit later. You are correct. There's quite a bit of circuitry connected to be able to implement the PD protocol. You are absolutely correct. And the last bit over here is the SBU. So SBU is called sideband, okay? And it's used to set up different types of um, um, protocols, for example. So in USB 3, it's not used, but in USB 4, it's used to set up the, the link. It's the back channel negotiation to optimize the link. So when the transmitter and receiver are trying to figure out what they want for equalization, those requirements are passed back and forth over the SPU lines. Mm -hmm. That's an example of SPU. Now, something else is that we didn't talk about, it's called alternate mode. Mm -hmm. 
I, I just wanted to mention this because I heard you can basically use it for, I don't know, display connection. And then it's not like really USB, it's transferring picture or That's something. correct. Right. So one of the um, capabilities of Type-C is the SBU lines can communicate and set up a contract for display port mode. So during the communication, during the PD negotiation, this whole link can be set up in PD, okay? And that's called uh, alt mode. When set up is alt mode, this whole link goes into DP mode. So these are used as the DP alt channels during alt mode. And in particular, these all become on the host side or the PC side, they all become TX. In other words, they become four display port transmitter outputs, mm -hmm. sending high resolution video from a from a uh, DP, uh, you know, the PC in DP mode, sending information over to the uh, a display, Type C display also in DP mode, and using the SPU channels in DP aux mode. So it 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 there's a there's this notion of alt mode where these pins, shall we say, uh, change uh, configurations mm -hmm. or change functions. And the last thing I think here that we didn't talk about is you notice here it says um, uh, CC one two, but over here you notice CC and it says uh, mm -hmm. VCon, and we'll talk about it later. But the unused CC pin on a cable, on an active cable, can be used for the host, a PC, to supply what we call VCon voltage to power up an active cable. So CC goes through here for set on a PD communication, and it says, hello, I'm an active cable that needs VCon. Oh. VCon comes in through here, through the CC pins, and that's a schematic that also describes that. So, so this is, for example, I have this USB extension cable. So, and on the end of the uh, extension cable, there is like box and I guess there is PCB inside because the USB extension cable is like, I don't know, three meters. Normally, USB 3 would not work over three meters, I, I guess. Correct. So a, that's how this a, beacon is used to power this. That's exactly small... correct. So you bring a good point. So if your USB 3 cable is more than about three feet, then it's got some kind of a, what we call a, 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 a repeater in there. So it could mm -hmm. be a retimer, a redriver, could be optical. All these have silicon in it. Well, PD has silicon too, but it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's different. But, but any of these active cables require more power and to your point is um, your cable will look a little thicker or fatter because it's got more components in there. And to power that up, it has to go through because VBus, the only thing connecting to your cable is VCon, right? VBus doesn't go to the uh, cable per se. So the, that power is called, uh, it's VCon. Mm -hmm. So VCon is powering your, your, you said you got a six meter or a six foot cable. For sure it's, uh, it's got a, it's active. And it's powered by VCon. Mm -hmm. Okay. And are, are there any other alternate alternative modes? Like you say, there is this display. Is there something else, or do they plan to yeah, put there, there something are, else? I, I believe there is a HDMI alternate mode version, and there is a MIP alternate version. But as far as I can tell, there has been very uh, limited adoption uh, for for the alternate mode. Okay. And to make things even more complicated, but I think uh, many of our customers will also like to know is there's also a tunneling mode. So now it's a next level of, uh, of, uh, of uh, complexity, if you will, which is what does tunneling mode mean? USB 4 is essentially a transport layer that runs at a very high speed rate. USB 4 introduced tunneling. So on these Four lanes, remember USB 4 runs TXRX1 and TXRX2 always in parallel. It can, on this transport lane at 20, 40, or 80 gigabits, tunnel PCI packets 
USB 3 packets, DP packets. So you can also run in tunneling mode. You can send packets because there are different rates. PCI, uh, USB 3, and, and DP runs at different rate. But they encapsulate these packets and trans transfer them over the USB 4 protocol in tunneling mode. And then they get taken up up the other side. And so you have DP silicon. You can just take, you can run it over the USB 4 tunneling mode and then be able to break it up into your DP packets mm -hmm. again. So you, you basically transfer a USB and, and display at the same time or? Do I understand that? Right? Uh, no, okay. no, you can only do it one at a time. So when you, you could run DP in DP tunnel mode, okay, but you cannot run um, in USB 4 mode, you cannot tunnel both, say, both DP and PCI at the same time. It only tunnels uh, one standard at a time. Okay. And, uh... but, but there is a strange mode. It's called, uh, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but there is a, a mode where you can run DP and USB at the same time okay. in USB 3. In that case, USB 3, USB 2 always runs here. You could use one pair of uh, this connectors mm -hmm. in USB 3 mode, and you can run the other pair in DP mode. That's a term for that, but it slips me at this mode. That's, it's, it's a rare usage because now you have a kind of a slow deep USB and you kind of a slow DP. It's not, there's not much implementation because customers like a lot of resolution, mm -hmm. but using these lanes, not alternate mode, you can run this, uh, this special mode where USB three runs on one pair and DP runs on two pairs. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a question. Um, so for USB, yes. USB four has exactly same connector. You nailed it. Exactly. Under USB four, it's exactly the same. Ground and VBUS doesn't change. USB 2 must not change. My mom's USB 4 computer would still have that. CC pin doesn't change because PD didn't change. SBU is used for the back channel. And the rates are much faster. Mm -hmm. So in USB 3, you run 5 gig or 10 gig. USB 4, now you run at 20, 40, or 80 gig. gig. And always in by two. Now, of course, you can what do you call the, you know, um, uh, you know, downshift or gear shift, fall back from by two. But the answer is same connector, just much higher rate on all TXRX pairs. Mm -hmm. What about Very good cables? Observation. Do you need special cable? Um. So when we went from USB 3 to USB 4, the answer is yes. We had, you had to buy new USB 4 cables. Mm -hmm. You're, just like when you went from USB 2 to USB 3, when the speed increased, you had to go buy cables. Similarly, when you go from USB 3 to USB 4, you had to buy cables. But when you go from USB 4 version 1 to the latest USB 4 version 2, they kept the same cables and connectors. Okay. Because they went to PAM3. Okay, we will talk about this later. I hope we still will have time. I have many questions. I would like to talk about power delivery now because there's like uh, something what I had to study when I wanted to use power from USB-C. I had to have a look how this actually works because it's not as simple as uh, five volt on on power pin. Can we talk about this little bit? Yeah, it's a fairly large and complex topic. So let's uh, let's use a couple of slides to try and illustrate the the differences at a high level. Then we get into some high level questions, and then we'll keep diving deeper and deeper depending on you know what you and your cuts our customers want to do. So first is the the specifications. And the first thing you'll notice is there's a new document. So throughout this session, we have been talking about the speed. So this particular speed is the USB 3.2 specification. There is a totally separate speed documentation for USB 2.0 and a totally separate speed document for USB 4. So there are speed documents that are completely independent 
of the other two documents over here, all right? So there's a USB 2, which is completely separate from USB 3, completely separate from USB 4, all right? So that's one document our customers must be able to understand. That's one. We also talked about this. This is the connected specification. This is also separate. There is a standard A, a B, a micro B, cable and connector specification. In this particular instance, I'm only showing one, which is the type C cable and connector. If we are doing type A or micro B, it's a different document. It's the physical type C cable and connector specification. And finally, Robert, because now we're switching gears, you asked about PD. This is also a completely separate document. It's called the USB power delivery or USB PD specification. It's key to know these are separate and independent documents. Now there are some linkages, but they're not the same because they, 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 they address three completely separate and independent topics. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing all our customers must do. They must be able to understand first that three doc kinds of documents kinds of because within each there are different documents and they must uh, to really study and understand that so that's the first uh, high level view or introduction to pd okay what is on the next slide okay the next is some of the uh, questions so now uh, the reason i created this this slide is you know we, we get this q and a's all the time so i i decided i'll just do a Q&A here live and try to take what we just learned from this slide to try and answer this document. Okay. Okay. So let's let's go to this and see if we are a little bit clearer. So we got a lot of questions about the dependencies between the PD, which we talk about, the Type C connector, and the speeds. So the the, the first question that comes up very often. Is Type C the same as PD? The short answer is no, because they are two separate documents. There's a lot of, uh, uh, shall we say, connections between the two documents and the terminology, but they are totally separate. One is the connector, the Type C connector, and one is the power delivery uh, requirements and specifications. So the answer is no. The next question is, can Type-C not implement PD? The answer is more nuanced than that. All Type-C must implement basic Type-C functionality, but not officially power delivery. Basic Type-C functionality means you must have something called the RP and RD resistor. Mm -hmm. It's in the Type-C spec, but it's not in the PC, PD spec. So the answer is yes. Type C implementations do not have to implement USB PD. Okay, I have But questions. they need to implement basic Type C uh, requirements that don't involve power delivery. Okay, so now I, I ask question. So if I understand right, the basic implementation is done by the external resistors, which we will show a little bit later. But the real PD is based on some kind of communication between the host and device, and they will agree on some voltages and, and current delivery, but they use some kind of protocol to talk to each other. <coughs> you are absolutely okay. correct, Robert. <laughs> Basic functionality resistors there's this silicon called PD controller silicon on both sides. And what they do is they negotiate mm -hmm. the PD contract. So mm -hmm. you're absolutely correct. Resistors do some basic uh, um, setups, but the these PD controllers will get to the next level of PD contract. Okay. You are absolutely correct. So the next bullet here, and by the time we're through here, I think, we and our, all our customers will be a little, little bit clearer, and me too, because I always get confused myself. Must USB 3.2 implement Type C? So USB 3.2 is a speed and technology. It's completely independent of the connector type. 
So for example, you can buy a USB 3 PC with a standard A connector. Yeah. You can buy a USB 3.2 uh, stick, memory stick with, uh, with a, uh, a type A plug. So the answer is no. USB 3.2 speed can run on, uh, on A. I haven't seen a B. Uh, yes, you can have a printer with a B. So the answer is no. USB 3.2 does not implement, does not need type C. Does USB 3.2 require PD? Answer is no. Mm -hmm. A USB 3.2 standard A computer and a 3.2 memory stick doesn't need PD. So those are easy. So it's mostly and, used for like adaptives or what? I, I was, I'm surprised you said computer does not have PD. So computer will usually only deliver five volts and that's it. Yeah, I think I'm speaking from the fact that I've been in industry for so long. A new computer today, a new computer today will implement PD. Okay. Right. I, I guess that could be some computers don't, but you will, you will not be competitive. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's some kind of a custom computer that doesn't, mm -hmm. but a, a, a PC that's sold on the market today will most probably implement PD. Okay. Most probably. But it's not required. They don't have to. Um, so let me see. I may or may not answer that. But if you buy a lower cost computer that does not have type C, I don't know. I haven't looked, but I assume there are some computers with no type C. If there is a computer on the market with no type C, then there's a high likelihood that computer will not have PD. Mm -hmm. I have my computer has type C and A. So it, it has uh, PD on the C, um, you know, the A doesn't uh, have PD, mm -hmm. the A connector, but uh, the computer itself has PD. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, okay. So if there is standard USB 3 A connector, there will be no PD, but if there is USB C, yeah. then there may be PD. Um, so does USB PD require, let's jump skip a slide because I think uh, the order is off. It says, does USB PD require type C? That's what you're alluding to. Well, you can implement PD on an A connector. Okay. <laughs> but it's very rare. Okay. So the, the early PD spec actually allowed PD to be done with the A connector. I personally haven't seen Okay. A, a PD with A. So technically you can, but I haven't seen it, which means that there's a good likelihood that if you have a PC with a standard A receptacle, like which I have the PC, it probably doesn't have PD on the A connector, Okay. but it will probably have PD on the C connector. Okay. Probably, that's, that's but I think. no guarantee. Okay. Right. So that's the, we jumped one question over here. Right. Okay. So now let's go back to this one here. Can USB 2 implement type C? And the answer is it's independent. Mm -hmm. So if you have USB 2 running on a standard A, let's say you have a, a computer, there's some computers that maybe just run USB 2, maybe. For, oh, for sure, if you have a USB stick, there are legacy sticks you buy for a dollar with USB 2, for sure that USB 2 stick doesn't do right it doesn't do type c and it doesn't do pd so it does neither so the answer is it doesn't but can it the answer is yes you can do a usb 2 memory stick with type c or you know standard a and it can do pd or it doesn't have to mm -hmm. so so that's this bullet you just don't connect all the pins on the connector. You just connect the essential you are correct. pins. Yeah, actually in the type C connector uh, specification, there is actually a USB uh, two type C cable and connector where the, the pins uh, uh, either don't exist or are not connected. And the, inside the cable, the lines are much simpler. They don't mm -hmm. have, it's a lower cost cable mm -hmm. because it doesn't have pins. So you are absolutely correct. The pins are either not connected or 
they do, they don't exist. So you have to be you know, careful a, what kind of USB C cable you buy because if you buy the one which only has USB 2.0, then it's useless if you would like to connect USB 3. You are absolutely correct. <laughs> that is one unique Type C cable, right? Well, that's not unique. There's a USB 2 only version, which with no USB 3 capabilities. There's a USB 3 cable, which must have USB 2. And then, of course, there's a USB 4 cable that looks just the same, but it will run USB 4 rates. I mean, you, you can connect a USB 3 cable to a USB 4 system, but during the negotiation, it will not link up. So you'll fall back to USB 3 because mm -hmm. there's just too much loss. So very great questions, by the way. <laughs> uh, let's see, does USB PD require Type-C? Oh, I did answer that. So the answer is not technically, but in all implementations I have seen, USB PD is on Type-C. Mm -hmm. And on today's PCs, Type-C will also have PD. But okay. I'm sure somebody's going to write a note that says, hey, you know, I have a, a Type-C. But it's also... Um, depends, right? If you have a USB stick, for example, on a device side, there will be many USB simple devices that do Type C but don't want need PD, right? It's going to happen. They just need VBus, and that's it. They're done. Now I have a very tricky question. When we, when <laughs> we are talking tricky. about PCs, uh, the the latest uh, laptops, for example, they may use this USB C connector to charge the laptop but you can also use it as as to co to connect to device so it can work like both directions this pd yeah i'm gonna have a detailed slide on that let's okay. get into deep dive but the answer is yes back in the old days i kind of mentioned the host with the a could only charge a device but with pd and it happens all the time in fact i'm sure you have it on your computer today if you go up to a dock and you you plug in that one Type-C cable, you notice, you, well, some people don't realize they still plug in a PC, but you don't need to. If you have a PD dock with a Type-C, the dock, which is plugged into the wall on your desk, charges your PC. Most ha people have that already today. If you bought a, yeah. a dock, it's like $100. So the answer is yes. With PD, your dock or device can actually charge your host yeah which I, I couldn't think, happen before I, I have also usb mm -hmm. bank which you can charge through same connector as you discharge it that it will be probably same you mean you have a usb pd bank yes Power if bank, you have a yeah. bank so you can charge it through usb c but then you can co disconnect it and connect your device and use the bank to power the device so it, it works it in depends. both ways yeah it depends i have a small not a bank but little um charging you know like a little brick that i bring with me but sometimes it will say to you it will say for example like it's pd compatible you can mm -hmm. flip it but if it's not pd compatible then it's bi-directional right mm -hmm. so generally the ones i have i'm trying to think where is it it has it generally has c or micro b to charge in and then a out but if you have a fancy one, for sure. I, I have one big one for laptops. We'll have only one C, then it's smart. You, you, can, you can charge it from that one C it knows, or you can use it to charge through that one C. Yeah. That's a smart one. I don't have a smart uh, bank like that, but the answer is yes. It can be charged or used to charge on a device on the exact same port. The answer is yes, okay. if it's PD compatible. And you'll see the PD little symbol over there too, uh, on the connector. But you'll have to check. Yes, it, it, will. it will. Well, it should, if it's compliant, it will have the little PD logo on it. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's go through the other let's questions see. because time is flying and... <laughs> no, that's okay, that's good. Uh, must a charger implement Type C? Well, the answer is now that we are the the, the answers come smoother now, right? So depends, right? If your charger is an A, clearly it doesn't need Type C. If the answer is a simple charge, hey, this is actually your bank. So the answer is it doesn't have to. It could be a simple basic charger where it's connected to five volts pull up only, and all it does is connect five volts. Or it could be like your charger. It could implement uh, Type C and PD. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right, so uh, how do you tell a product is PD implemented? <laughs> That's this my question tricky. too. That's your question too. So <laughs> the USBIF strongly recommends that the, 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 a product goes to logo certification and uses a logo. Because USB is so common, the USBIF doesn't have the ability to go after every single vendor in the world, and there are millions. So technically, if you put the PD logo on, you must have USBIF certification, all right? They want it. Now today, I believe if you go to Amazon or Best Buy, whatever, all those you know big companies that do this, it will say words like uh, USBIF certified. I believe there's a contra uh, agreement between USBIF and some of these big name stores that say, if they put a logo, they must be certified. They just can't put a logo. Mm -hmm. So the the official way is that the, the, the product will have a logo that mm -hmm. says USB PD. Now, if somebody pirates a cable or whatever, puts it on, it's hard to tell, right? Because they can put a logo, I mean, I think there are handbags out there with, you know, Louis Vuitton <laughs> that are not logo certified, right? Or a Gucci bag. I don't know. Some, 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 some bag. I'm sure somebody could tell if the a bag is, is certified. So, but there are fakes out there. So I think it's hard. But I think the big name stores have the agreement the USBF, so that if the advertising says certified, then it is certified. That's the best way you can tell. Because if you look at a product, like for me, if I look at a bag, I can't tell if it's, you know. Yeah, same for me. You know, especially if you buy something manufactured in China, then. Exactly, right? Like, you, you cannot you tell. Can't tell. What so how do you, you tell? tell? Are there some kind of simple devices which you can just plug in and the device will tell you? Uh, I think there are. I, I do have something like this. But I never understood what ah. it was saying. So now, after this video, I will have a look again. Yeah. So I think there are some simple products that look for basic. No, it, it can look for Type C, but PD is a little bit more complicated because it needs to be a set up a contract. Mm -hmm. So I think that devices they can look for RPRD, or uh, maybe it's got some basic uh, way to look at PD. Mm -hmm. But it's going to need some kind of PD silicon in it. Okay. But I think they exist. Okay. But it needs some brains to be able to. Basically, it has to set up the contract to say, hey, does it respond? And mm -hmm. it does, then you know it's PD compatible. Mm -hmm. So, but it needs some kind of a PD silicon. But it can be useful to buy something like this because many times you even don't know what kind of cables you have, what kind of devices. Maybe you can, you can measure it very simply and then connect everything correctly. <laughs> See, Robert, you and I live in a different world. <laughs> I have test equipment. So I can, I can hook it up. We have got different products that will set up these PD contracts for testing. So we know right away if it, if it is compatible, because we can, we have the query, right? As part of testing, we have products that query the, the, the PD cable because some customers want to test under different PD conditions. Mm -hmm. So we have to query it and scan through the different ones. And for you, since you're in this industry, yes, I think, uh, you, you know, you could get one of our key site solutions, or I think they're a little less expensive ones, perhaps that may, may, may tell you what, what PD, uh, you know, um, it has, right? I, I'm sure they, they exist, uh, these kind of products. Okay. What is the next? Okay. Thing? Going on here. Yeah. Can USB 3.2 implement type C? Can it? The answer is yes, it can. And no, it doesn't have to. So, uh, will PD compliance be mandatory? Ah, we already answered that. So the answer is yes, technically it's mandatory, but we cannot prevent bad players from shipping something. And putting even on putting on a fake logo, that's mm -hmm. just life, you know, and the reality is, you know, so I think the, the best guidance to our customers is to make sure that at least it says, you know, at a le legit site that it's got, you know, USB PD, USB 3 uh, certification by USB IF. How does okay. the PD logo look? Uh, it, it will say, uh, uh, it's just say like PD or there's a little, I don't, I think I may have it on some of the slides. Let me see if I can find a version. It looks like a little battery. But for sure, if you go to USB IF site, you will, you will see versions of that. 
the USB.org site will have pictures of uh, the certification. And they they've been changing it, and some with the speed also. It looks like a little battery. I may, I may find it on the internet and put it uh, Yes, on you the should. Screen. Okay, uh, so the site to go to is USB.org. It's public, and it will show you what the latest version is. Uh, okay, so this one is a logo, but it's only got a speed. It's missing the little battery symbol. But yes, please, um, go to USB.org. It's where you will see the official logo. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, PD implementation. I see the schema. Okay. I see a, a schematic. Of, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So all these uh, specs, uh, uh, we have to, um, you know, they are they're courtesy of the USB IF. They're all public, but they come from the USB IF, which uh, we help we work with to define the spec. So this is not the PD version, but the most basic implementation. So this is not in the PD spec, it's in the type C spec, but you must have this, uh, this components. So let's look at the simplest implementation of a, say a legacy or a simple host and device. Generally a host doesn't, uh, just has an RP, okay? So remember, we, we showed you the two CC lines earlier. So this is one CC line, and this is the other CC line. So the host has to advertise both uh, RP. Mm -hmm. The cable has only one CC line. So this connects this CC to the other side. Mm -hmm. And a typical device, non-PD, has this RD and this RD. Mm -hmm. So that it, it, this way, the host knows which lane, let's say it's a by one implementation of USB 3, which USB 3 lane the data is going to come from. And the device also knows which USB lane to connect. So it's a very simple host device, right? You know, the device will always, always only have an RD and the host will always have an RP. All okay, right. I so have... that's a basic implementation. A question. <clears throat> RA is implemented inside of the cable or? RA. Yes, so um, I didn't describe that, but the reason for RA is it's a resistor for the VCON, which I'll show later. Okay. It's a termination, so you can pick up, uh, yes, on it's found on active cables or say a PD capable cable. So the it doesn't have yes. to be inside of the cable. That's correct. It doesn't have to be. That's why it's, a, it's, it's an optional capability, but it must be there for active cables. Okay. Must be. Okay, and RP value depends on capabilities of the... That's hall? correct. Okay. It advertises what the default type C uh, capabilities and RD also uh, says what this, uh, the, the, uh, Required. the default values are. Okay. So they can set it up. Okay. Um, okay, so this, this is the most basic implementation. And this is a little bit more complex, but this also has to do with some adapters, in other words, there are customers who want to connect, say, a legacy adapter. So they just, the adapter will have a RD, for example, or a legacy uh, receptacle. Then it also has an RP, uh, hardwired to one side only, as, a, as an example of an adapter. So okay. adapter, it means they just connect CC to ground through resistor and the adapter will automatically uh, deliver five volts. That's correct. Or high. RP two volts, exactly. So in, anytime you have adapted, it means the product you're connecting to is a legacy non type C, non PD legacy, you know, old USB two miles and old PC. Um, you know, this was early days. I have this from early days, but today, um, you know, there's less energy there. Customers just go buy a new USB C mouse or or something. Mm -hmm. So, but these were early days for customers who are. Uh, there's always um, a resistance to changing, right? Like, why do I want to why to buy a new Type C mouse or a Type C drive when my old one works? Mm -hmm. So these adapters were uh, were much more common. Oh, adapter! It means like cable adapter, for example. Oh, no, no. So the way you want to think about it is let's look at the use case. So let's, um, uh, in, the, in the early days, right, very early on, there were companies that only came with a type C uh, uh, host. In fact, um, you're seeing more and more a trend where you, you, there are hosts with no uh, A anymore. 
only type C. Ah, okay. Well, what do you do then? What if you have an old um, engine transit? Let's say you, you know, there was no mouse, so you're not able to buy it. So uh, adapter will allow you to use a USB two device plug. Yeah, that's what I mean. So it, it may be short host. cable or it may be small device. Yeah, it's just have. a little device. Mm -hmm. It's a little mechanical product mm -hmm. that, um, that like connector or one kind of, of one type of connector on one side and the other type of connector on the other side yeah for example <clears throat> on a a receptacle one side will plug into say a c which is let's see look at this this side will be a c that mm -hmm. goes into the c uh, connector with the rd already um set and on this side will be a a receptacle mm -hmm. right so it looks it looks like a legacy uh, V bus old days. I understand. So what do you have on okay. on page number six? I think there are the Great. exact. Now we're getting to. Now this is now we switch gears to PD, and we're going to spend a little bit more time on this slide oh. because we want to look at how <clears throat> a full PD contract could work. So there are many many pieces, but we want to start with the basics. Uh, before we, we, want before we start with this, I would like to mention, I think the if we go on page number five, I think the standard values of these uh, RD resistors are, I don't remember, 5.1K, if you would like to have five volts. Um, this, it's, this, it's oh, also okay. in the spec. Okay. So you have this, this these values over here also to, to advertise what the uh, the RPs are, How do you what, what it can do. Oh, right here. So. So, um, if you want to advertise uh, uh, RP, if you have a, uh, if if you if we can only do USB power, let's assume, then if you have a current source implementation, this is what you advertise. If you have a pull up, you use this or you use this, depending on what your implementation is. And then okay. if you want to advertise 1.5, these are the implementations and even advertise three amps. This is default, right? Because once you go to PD, then it's completely different. Okay. Why, it, it, why it, it I negotiates. it's 5.1K. 5.1K. Um, let's see now. Is that RD? You maybe think of RD. I don't mm, remember off the top of my head. No. But... Okay. Yeah, there's let's, no 5 let's for continue. RP. Okay, let's continue. <clears throat> yeah, I think RD is set. It just you know fixed. Okay, so so we talk about RP and RD. <clears throat> oh yeah, I meant RD. A... Yeah, I meant RD. Yeah, I don't think I have the RD RD here. I don't think I drew that on here. Okay, okay. So yeah, I think I RD think was five point one k. I think you're right because then it works in conjunction with the you know either the resist pull up or the current sources, right? To, to figure out what the, yeah, the, 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 right. the default power should be, should be, okay? So connecting the previous site, let's start with the basics again. The basics is still here in yellow. Mm -hmm. You have the five volt. So, so let's look at high level. This, 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 this is the, the Let's look at it as a, as a PC for now. Let's just start with a PC, a host for now. This is the PC on the left, the cable in the middle, and a device on the right. So we can look at the different parts. <clears throat> and let's look at some fundamentals. So five volts goes to RP through one CC line to RD to ground. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what we saw on the previous slide. Very basic uh, functionality. Okay. So we have the basic RP. RD connection. We have a very basic V bus and very basic ground. All right. So this is the most basic type C connection. Now there are more and more buttons or switches here. So let's start adding more and more details to some of this. So first, <clears throat> um, why is there another RP? Well, we talked about that earlier, right? If the cable goes from here to here, then this RP is uh, activated. So that's why there is two RPs and the two RDs. We also talk about that. Why is there an, two RPs on the left and two RDs? Because the cable could connect here and then this RD, you know, right, could 
be switched here also. So that's why there's two RPs here and two RDs. Now, something we have not seen prior to this point is there's an RD over here also, and there's RD here. This is where things get complicated. <clears throat> or better for my mom. So in the old days, the, the, the PC was, and to your point, right? It was the charger. You didn't want to accidentally hook up two PCs, two supplies together, okay? <clears throat> but in this new world, PD allows the negotiation. That's the key word, PD negotiation. They all have to agree. They have to agree, which is, am I a, a data host, data provider, a data sync? Am I a power source and sync? In other words, they can be, either one could be a host or device, and either one could provide power or sync. PD sets it up. That's key, contract. It's not random. The PD contract, at a high level, this host says, hello, I'm a PC, I'm fully charged, I can give you, you know, 100 watts, and I, I can send and read data. The device says, hello, I'm a USB stick, I don't have any power, I would like to get power, but I can only take 5 volts power. The cable says, hello, I'm a USB 2 cable. During the PD negotiation, it will come up to what the best this, all of this can do. Mm -hmm. So the host will say, oh, okay, I will give VBUS 5 volts, but I'll run at USB 2 because the cable is stuck at USB 2. Mm -hmm. The device says, well, yeah, I'll, I could do USB 3, but I like the power. I'll take your 5 volts and I'll also gear shift to USB 2. So that whole link now happily runs at USB 2 at 5 volts. Okay. Okay. So, so how, how this actually is implemented? Uh, it's, it's have, uh, so that this, the line that goes here. Together. Yeah. So what's, uh, what you see over here is. You, you, okay, so let's look at this connection. So let's say now they're talking. You notice there's an additional line between the RP and CC1. Mm -hmm. You see this wire that comes over here? Uh, yes. Not only does it go to RP basic, this line connects to a controller. There's a chip in there, a PD controller here, and that same line here goes over to this controller. Mm -hmm. So there is silicon on both sides. These are called the PD controller silicon. And it is the one doing the negotiation mm -hmm. and advertising. And it's all the communication is done over this CC line, a single CC line that allows communication between so what both. What kind of protocol? Is it like some kind of special protocol or? Yeah, yeah, it is. So we'll, there's a slide on that too. Yeah, this physical layer. It's half duplex clearly because there's only one line. It runs a very low 300 kilobits per second with a BMC coding and it uses the single CC line, okay? Very low speed, simple communication during the, uh, the uh, connection, all right? So that protocol runs over this tap, if you will. But what you see here is the basic functionality. The fact is there's only one line. So the, the anymore now customers don't have all these discrete parts. Everything that you see here RP, the five volts pull up, not VCon, notice it's different. It's all connected to one PD silicon. One silicon, PD silicon connects VCon, five volt pull up, RP, RD, uh, etc. cetera. It, yeah. It's a piece of silicon that does all of this work. Okay. I understand. So that's how the communication is done to this um, uh, PD silicon. <clears throat> Do you so this is just a schematic. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have something a little bit more about the protocols, what they can talk about, what they can agree on? Um, yeah, I don't have this in this in this deck, but uh, in the USB PD spec, uh, the there's a negotiation where essentially 
all three, first thing is the, the host controls it. It, 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 it. it knows what it has. It's, it's the main controller. It queries the CC, the cable, and ask the cable what it, it what cable it, cap, capabilities it has. It queries the device to see what capabilities it has. And then it, it actually decides um, at a PV level what the link should run at. So that's the, uh, the view, the PV spec. I don't have, uh, maybe I do have it here. Let me, let me poke, poke around here. Um, okay, so this is the communication link and protocol itself. I have this another question. The, uh, I have another question. So let's say you have, you connect charger and computer together. So both can do, uh, both can deliver power. Who is going to start talking first? No, this is all great questions. So, <clears throat> so let's say the charger, let's assume for now it's a, it's a basic, uh, not very smart charger, right? Well, let's say it's a smart charger. So the, the host, um, they, they have the ability to both want to take control. So this host could start a communication that can do too. But during the negotiation, there is the ability to do a, a, a functional swap. So if both want to talk, one will be swapped. So one is forced into a position so that they can both. But remember, they're not in control. They are just advertising. Yeah. There's, it's called, uh, I think it's called a fast roll swap. So, because so, when both come up. So the one which, right. are, which will start first, that the one which will talk first. <laughs> yeah, or something like that. But the swap still decides. So let's say uh, it, it just has to do it who polls, but doesn't set it up, right? So let's, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, <clears throat> at the end of the day, they both must decide what they want. So let's say the charger wants to be in control because it clearly cannot be charged. It only wants to charge. Let's just say, right? And it, it comes out and says, I want to charge. Let's say the protocol has that ability. All it wants to do is charge. So now this thing will, will come up. The host will say, there are two options for it. He says, I'm fully charged, or in many cases, sometimes the, uh, some hosts don't like to be charged, right? They, they, they don't want, you know, the, some earlier implementations of PD did not like it. So they use the regular, Plugin, remember? In fact, my computer still has a regular plugin because they didn't want to play with PD. And in that case, the host says, I don't ever want to be charged by the PD because mm -hmm. I don't trust your implementations. Things are changing, but the early computers, PD did not want to be charged. The mm -hmm. early implementations, because they didn't like a cable that was not PD compatible, mm -hmm. compliant, or a charger. So early, when I say early, this is what, three, four, five years ago, early PCs, were charged normally, they only ran data in type C. Mm -hmm. So it would say, hey, charger, don't charge me up. So nothing happens with the charger just because the charger has no thing. So, so the link does not happen. Nothing happens. Now, the P let's say today's computer, a new one, <clears throat> it comes up and says, I'm fully charged. I don't need any help. So the link just drops. There's no negos. It, 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 it advertises, but there's no, nothing unless it doesn't want to charge. But if it says, hello, my charge is low, I'd like to be charged, then the contract is set up, which is mm -hmm. in that case, the charger will, will charge over VBUS, the host that needs to be charged. Mm -hmm. So that's how uh, PD works. It's a, it's a very simple, well, the implementation and testing is not simple, but the, 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 the rationale is fairly simple. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I, I'm going to interrupt because Please. We are running out of time. So what else okay. is uh, super important to mention about uh, USB-C and USB 3.2? Because maybe we would like to move uh, and talk a little bit about move USB on, 4. I think the last thing is we want to finish up this picture by the other pieces, right? So we can edit it out. But notice here, that's VBUS. But notice over here, VBUS source and sync. So mm -hmm. the point here is either side now can source power of sync power, that's one. And you asked about the RA, so notice here, this is the CC line that's used, but on the CC line that's not used, you will notice there's a separate voltage called VCON, mm -hmm. connector power, 
the provides R connects to RA on an active cable. All right, so that's how you interpret a full blown PD with active cable, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, mm -hmm. so I just want to make sure that we we went through all the different little parts of this uh, slide. Yeah. All right, sorry for interrupting. Go ahead, Robert. No, now no. ask your question. So is there something else what we should mention for USB 3.2? Or we can move to USB 4. USB 4, I think it's not like widely implemented right now. So we can just mention what we should expect. But then I would like to also talk a little bit yeah. about how to measure and validate USB. So that's, I sure, might just sure. quickly go through this. Uh, maybe I have been lucky, but all the computers that I have or purchased, they all have USB 4. I think a lot really? of customers don't realize that a computer they buy have Type-C. I mean, for the longest time, most people, um, even my, my friends, didn't realize Type-C was there and I pointed to them and they go, oh, that's a Type-C connector. <laughs> but so not USB think, 4. Uh, Is it USB 4? Um, yeah, I think they are fairly widely available, but uh, maybe I just get the uh, high-end ones. I don't know. But there are, man there are many, many USB 4 co computers out there. Okay. Yeah, I would Would I say most of them? I haven't looked lately, but I'd say most computers have USB 4. I could be wrong. I, again, you know, I may, may, maybe because I'm in this world, I get, you know, I didn't the USB know 4 that. computers. So it's moving, um, so, yeah, it's so fast. I think, um, <clears throat> I think what, something I didn't, mention which may be relevant is in about 2015 you may have heard of the word thunderbolt thunderbolt yeah. 3 yeah so a brief overview thunderbolt 3 products were shipped around 2015 or so and a year or two a couple of years back uh, uh, intel donated the Thunderbolt specification to the USB IF, mm -hmm. and that became USB four. Oh, so in many ways, and Thunderbolt three is compatible to USB four. So if you have a Type C Thunderbolt three product, it behaves to as far as cables, connectors, and all, it behaves just like a USB four product. It's it's they are uh, they are compatible. So. In a, in a sense, USB 4 products have been shipping since 2015, but they were called Thunderbolt 3 back then. So maybe that's part of the uh, the, the confusion around, around I that. I didn't know this. Okay, Correct. and I think so, important is what you mentioned, it is PAM 4 or what is it? Uh, nope, it's not. So USB 4, <laughs> the the... First generations, what we call Gen 2 and 3, USB 4 version 1, USB 4 Gen 2 and 3, well, NRZ okay. and Thunderbolt 3. I think we should explain this again a little bit. What does it mean? I I think we have to. This is a top slide. We, we, we rightly did not discuss this earlier because it was confusing, but I think it's time to, to get to that now. Remember the slide, how we said, let's not talk about, about three. this. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, but let's, yeah, we didn't. But let's talk about, it's time to talk about the top half now. So, once again, this is a specification. We, our engineers, our customers, must know what's on the left of this line. We need to know, read the spec. The spec used to be called USB 4. It's been deprecated. There's only one spec now. It's called a USB 4 version 2.0 specification, specification document. In it, you see Gen 2 and Gen 3, NRZ. This is similar to Thunderbolt 3 and Thunderbolt 4. And this is the logo, okay? So USB 4 spec originally only had these two rows and these rates. A year or two ago, a new spec was released called USB 4 version 2.0, which added Gen 4 25.6 gig PAM 3 and this logo, okay? So this line is important because this is how we document it, but this number means nothing. 
to to you and I and for test management because this is essentially a a a a, a, a dual a by two bit rate. It's more of a marketing number, but it's very important because it clarifies to our customers, to my mom, what the speed is. She doesn't care about this stuff. We, in a sense, don't care about this. So when I talk to my our customers, to, to so we get we get away from all this. I always ask them, "Are you looking at a USB standard that is twenty five point six gig PAM three? That's how I ask. I don't use this word. I don't use this word. I ask them specifically: Is your five bit rate twenty five point six PAM three? Is your five bit rate?" 20.625 in RZ. Is your five bit rate 10 gig by one or by two? I focus only on these two columns for okay. testing because these words are very confusing. Okay. So hopefully that also helps you clarify the, the many terms yeah, for I, logo and internally. I would like to mention again, I was making video about NRZ and um, three, eight, and all the other. So it will be explained a little bit more in the other video, but just uh, very quickly, NRZ, it means there are only two uh, voltage levels, like zero and one, but PAM3 will have four different levels, correct? I think you have I yeah. somewhere here. Yeah, I think a simple way to, 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 to look at this is to call PAM NRZ PAM2. So PAM2 means two levels, zero and one. So it's yeah. PAM2. Three, PAM3 means three. Okay, three so levels. So three levels. So PAM2, zero and one with I. PAM3, three levels, you know, say minus one, zero plus one, and two I's. Yeah, you have and it I've somewhere. Got, I, I think yeah, I think I can see from here. So that's PAM2 yeah. and RZ, zero and one. And I think, oh, right yeah, here. here. I got PAM3. PAM one, two, three, two, two levels, uh, three levels and two eyes. So basically okay. uh, we use same frequency, but we can transfer more data. Close, close enough such that cables and connectors did not need to change close. So if we go back to that slide, it's not same, not identical. So you notice here, this is okay. 20 gigabits. This is slightly faster. 25.6 gigabaud. This baud rate now, not bit rate. Right? This right with PEM3. Right? So the unit interval is a little bit faster. The clock is a little bit faster. So it's not identical. Okay. Okay. Uh so very quickly, how can we validate this? Uh so we designed a board. And we would like to be sure the board can support USB 3.2 or USB 4. Uh, what shall we do as an engineer? How can I be sure that my board is running and meeting all the specifications and it's, it can be validated and we can place the USB logo there? Yeah, I think, um, let's see if this covers that. Yes, I think, um, I want to use this slide to, to show that because um, it really alludes to your point, right? How can we ensure that our customers, uh, ultimate customer, customers of our customers have the best uh, experience? So I use this example because it's a superset. So let's say that we are working to uh, ship, you know, so Robert, you and I, we're going to a new company, we're going to sh start shipping a USB 4 version 2 product. A a PC or some, some high-end product, okay? So what do we have to do? <clears throat> so as you and I know, right, it's very expensive to turn silicon and make prototypes, very expensive. So the very first thing we got to do is we need to run simulations, mm -hmm. you know? Simulations are not cheap, but they are a lot cheaper than do a silicon turn and a lot faster. So on the bottom left in this design cycle, we want to make sure we simulate as best as we can, as best as we can. We run it, we, we check it, and we want to make sure that there's correlation, right? We want to make sure that the simulation on the left in this case, 
the output can be run to the uh, the, uh, the correlation tool. So in the Keysight world, since we're it's the same company, we collaborate such that uh, the the, uh, the simulation can take measurement input. Clearly, that's how, it's measurement input, right? To 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 refine the simulation models and simulate the simulation output can be also the uh, input into the measurement. This is all software, right? So you can so you can one, actually compare how good the simulation was, yes, for example. Actually, in the bottom left, this is the simulation. This is actually an RZI. Actually, the left is a simulation eye, and the right, it's kind of tiny here, but it, it actually shows. I may have a slide also to show that the uh, simulation output and the measurement output. Okay. What so do yes, we yes, need for yes. the simulation? Uh, you use Keysight C Pro. That's what is there. Exactly. We have this ADS design software, mm -hmm. and we have these uh, specialized uh, tools that we uh, Pro. available. Correct. To be able to um, uh, simulate these USB for version two, version one, USB three. Even USB two, if you so choose. All right. So step one. So once we have got the, the simulation, we think we're very, very good. We ask our manager, "Hey, you know, we're we are ready to, uh, you know, get this chip, this design, this board. Let's go fab it. We're gonna put some money and go build some early prototypes. Right? We're not we're quite ready for production yet. So the the board comes back. Now this is a proof in the pudding. So Robert, I like to use an example. Let's let's hook it up now. Let's uh, hook it up to a USB, you know, stick or video and go." Hey, it works. It's perfect. We can ship it, right? We can go, hey, worked in my lab. We'll, let's start production. Let's build a thousand of them. But in a proper way, we should look at, we should test it and make sure that it's got margins of compliance. So generally the output of this device is known as transmitter, right? The output signal. So we have very specialized software that, and the keyword is automated. We automate testing for, in this case, USB 4 version 2, we have automated, automated TX software for uh, USB 3.2, automated version for USB 2, right? Everything is automated, right? Because there's a, the specs are quite detailed. The compliance specs are very complicated. It's very hard to set this up manually. So we have these automated solutions that do automated transmitted testing. What does I'm it mean automated? It, it means, from my experience, it means like you start a uh, you start your scope, then you go to menu, uh, start uh, some kind of, I don't know, test, validation test. You select what kind of USB you would like to validate. And then there are steps like use this board, connect uh, this cable, connect it here, uh, press this button, then scope automatically runs some kind of test. It will tell you like pass, fail. And it will tell you, okay, in the next step, connect different cable or different connector. That's how it works. Yeah, you, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> so you did, you, you bring up very good point. So the automation has to do with making sure your physical setup is done. Very good point. Once the physical setup is done, if you push the button, the test will automatically run. But you bring up a good point. Right now, Keysight doesn't have the ability to automatically physically connect these things yet. Maybe in the future, there'll be a robot that can do that. But the answer is, the physical connections are not done, done by Keysight. We give you guides step by step to hook it all up. And then when everything's physically, mechanically hooked up, the test is automated. That's exactly correct. Okay. And I've seen, uh, can we show some kind of uh, boards what you may need for this test? Because I've seen you have some some pictures here uh, on yeah. some of the pictures. So, um, so first we can look at the... Uh, the, the the reason for these uh, fixtures over here, right? So let, let's look at the uh, the scope and for okay. example, the scope has an SMA input generally, right? Some kind of a you know SMA or a 2.92, 2.4 or 1.8, whatever. It looks like this, but the dot or the product is a USB connector. So there's got to be a way for a USB connector to connect to a scope. So there are many different kinds of products that can connect, but generally on one end, they're gonna be a type C connector, right? Because that's what USB is. And on the other end, some kind of cable. So there's some pictures of pictures over here, right? So um, no, that's not good on this calibration. That's not a good one. Right here. This this in particular happens to be a USB-I picture set. 
what you can see is these on one end, these are various types of C connectors, mm -hmm. right? A, a type C plug, a type C receptacle. And then of course, on the other side, it's your typical SMA connector, right? So this side goes to a USB device PC. This side then goes to a scope mm -hmm. or a bird or a VNA. Okay, so this this is it's a great question because how do you connect a USB product, Type C product, to a scope? Well, it's just this fixture or breakout or adapter, whatever you want to call this thing, but it converts, you know, one end USB, the other end uh, measurement world. Great okay. question. Another question. So. Do you need to run, run some kind of test or there is a test implemented uh, in the USB controller or because you need to, during the test, you need to maybe transfer some special package or something. I don't know how it works. Yes, you are absolutely correct. It doesn't matter which standard it is. There are certain specific patterns that need to be output. For example, I can see it in the corner here. In USB 3, these are the compliance patterns. So for Gen 1 or 5 gig, you have to output CP0 to CP8. Uh, if you do Gen 2, it's CP10 to CP15, for example. And it depends. So in USB, that's USB 3.2. In USB 4, it transmits signals like PRBS 15, uh, PRBS 31, electrical idle, SQ2, and USB 4, your PRTS. But your answer is, your, your, your comment is absolutely correct. Depending on the standard, there, there are always some kind of patterns you, you need to put out or inject, and they are different depending on the standards. And how do you do speed. this? I think uh, there are applications uh, which will yeah, so let's talk about the differences. So in this USB 3.2 world, the silicon, it's in the spec and the silicon must do it. Okay. Automatically, you, you must, when, the, when a device sees 50 ohms with no LFPS in this link training, this is the LTSSM state machine. If you look over here, it says, uh, First LFPS timeout, compliance mode enabled. Oh, okay. So you don't even need like special software. The you, USB you don't controller need to do that. support the test mode or this, something. Right. You, you're supposed to by, 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 by okay. spec. Uh, LFPS means there's a link partner. So when, the, when a, our PC and a, a device is talking, it, it goes down to the, the stage. But timeout means there's no link partner. It's a scope then it exits to compliance mode mm -hmm. by default. It, it has to, so that's for USB 3. Mm -hmm. For USB 4, it's different. There is a separate controller that tells the silicon or the dot to output these patterns. So mm -hmm. the test method, uh, fixtures, et cetera, uh, are a little bit different or maybe quite a bit different between say, you know, say USB 3, USB 4 version one, version two. But in this particular instant, it's in the spec in the uh, link training state machines uh, status. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's 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 how it's um, it, it's done. Okay, so then maybe one of the last questions: What if someone would like to test their board? So what they would need? I think it's the last uh, slide. Yeah, I think we go back to here yeah. again. Uh, yeah. So um, so so at a high level, this is the transmitter test which is required. And remember, from the, the Type-C connector is TX and RX. Every silicon or product you have has both a transmitter and receiver. So you should do a transmitter test, generally with a scope and fixtures and software. Same for receiver. Mm -hmm. You should be doing a receiver test, generally with a BERT, fixtures, and software. And of course, if you are a cable customer, you have to do an uh, interconnect or uh, uh, return loss test or if you do support, for example, if you're in custom support and your, uh, the customer says your product doesn't work, well, sometimes it's not your product, but a customer is using a USB 2 cable or mm -hmm. a, a non-compliant cable. So even as a PC customer, you need to have some knowledge about how to test a cable because your customer will use it as part of their the test. I mean, it doesn't work, they blame you. 
And then to finish that picture, because it's USB 4 version 2 is backwards compatible because my mom's mouse, you need to have design simulation, we need to have decoding solutions, debugging solutions, PD solutions, RF solutions, channel characterization, this is from the silicon to the, to the port, SBU, the sideband solutions, USB 2 and 3 solutions. Many products must be Thunderbolt compatible and many hosts and must be DisplayPort compatible also. So, not, so if we're going to ship a USB 2 product, Robert, we must be familiar with all these terms because they all are required. USB we cannot just say tool. version. Exactly. Yeah. We cannot just say, Robert, now, unless you're, even if a silicon, you can, we can't just say, Robert, we're going to just only focus on version two and nothing else. You cannot sell a product that yeah, only yeah. does version two in general. Okay. You know, there's some products you can. Okay. So another question. I know it was the last one before, but. So if you would like to test the receiver, do you need to have some kind of transmitter? Uh, no, yes. So the, the, the product is the receiver, right? The pins, the pins on the receiver. So remember, we went to your, 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 the Type-C connector. A USB product will have a transmitter and receiver, yeah. right? I, I, so in a... I know t uh, to test transmitter, it's simple because you can measure it by scope. But how do you test the receiver? Do you need to have a generator or something? You, you nailed it precisely. Because we are testing a receiver, you need a pattern generator and input. That product is called a BERT, a bit at a rate tester. But it essentially is a pattern generator, essentially, and something called an error detector. So that's why it's it's called a bird. It's a bit error rate tester. But you are correct. We have to send a stimulus or input, and in particular, a stressed stimulus into the receiver to do receiver testing. You are absolutely correct. Okay. So these were all the questions what I wanted to ask. Uh, and uh, I think there is still a lot of material. If, uh, if people like this video uh, and they would like to learn more, they should leave comments and we can talk more. But I think we covered a lot and I really hope it uh, it can help people to understand a little bit more about these differences and how it works. I look forward to our next session, Robert. Hopefully we get lots of questions, confusing questions, and <laughs> that gives an opportunity to have another follow-up session. I look forward to another session with Robert. It was really a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed this. So thank you very much, Jit. You're welcome, Robert. I had a great time myself. I love the questions. I had to think. You asked a lot of tough, difficult questions. You, me, you had to make me think again, but you know, um, it's fun. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that's everything. Thank you very much for watching this video. By the way, we are preparing some very interesting tutorials, so if you don't want to miss them, hit the subscribe button. If you want, you can also check out our Fedevel online courses, where you will find everything important from basic board design up to advanced hardware design and PCB layout. The link is in the description. That's all for this video. Thank you again. Don't forget to leave your comments and see you next time. Bye.